Hi. It's really good to be here in this, in this beautiful city. It's my first time in Moscow, and my first time in Russia, actually. So thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, before I came, I did some research on Moscow, most of the touristy things I know already, uh, but I actually wanted to know how the city had evolved, and I learned that Moscow is now the largest city in Europe. Uh, I didn't know that. I also learned that in the 2010 census, apparently, you couldn't actually count how many people you had. Uh, so some people said that it was 11 million, but there was some disagreement. Um, and uh, some specialists argued that it was something like 15 million, but uh, untracked populations coming into Moscow. And Moscow is not the only city in the world that is growing at that rate, uh, that rate so uh, huge that we cannot actually count has, um, how many people we have. Actually, 60% of the world population will live in cities by 2030. We're already at over 50%, so we are an urban world. The region that I come from, Latin America, has over 80% of people living in urban areas. Just to give you a sense, even though many of you may have a picture of South America or Latin America as a rural place, it's not. Um, but one thing about cities, too, and of course you all know that, and I think Moscow is also an example of that, is that they are increasingly unequal. I come from one of the most unequal cities in the world, uh, Rio, and those two pictures actually were taken maybe a kilometer apart from each other. Um, the picture, one of them is from Hosinga Islam in Rio, and the other one is a shopping mall right in front of it. It's a luxury shopping mall called Fashion Mall, uh, where the, the Rio elite goes shopping. Um, Cities are also responsible for a large portion of our greenhouse gas emissions and our energy consumption. So as we talk about the challenges of climate change, the challenges of poverty, the challenges of building a fairer and better world for all of us, we cannot leave cities out of the conversation, of course. And what's interesting to me is that cities are also at the center of a very specific crisis, which is the crisis of democracy itself. Um, so we see in cities a disengagement from, city, from citizens, uh, and they're no longer necessarily interested in participating in democratic institutions, even when they are allowed to do so. Um, so I brought you a few examples of turnout rates for mayor elections uh, across the world, and you can see they're actually at a, at a historical low. Um, even in Paris, actually, where we had a pretty interesting election the last time with two women running for mayor, uh, we had what for uh, French standards wasn't a very big turnout rate. Los Angeles is one of the most interesting cases with less than a quarter of registered voters showing up to, uh, showing up to elect their mayor. How crazy is that? The people are just not really interested in doing that. Um, but what I'm here to talk about is the solution side of this. So how do you get people engaged in cities again so they are energized and united enough to actually address some of those issues that I mentioned? Um, and I'm going to give you a few examples from my own work, um, which we have developed in Rio. We're essentially a very big community of citizens that work with each other to engage in city issues and campaign on things that we really care about. Um, and the first example I'm going to give you is from um, a public school in Rio. Uh, this was a campaign started by students in that public school. Uh, we're talking about one of the best public schools in the state of Rio, one of the best in the country, in the country where public education actually, uh, by and large, sucks. So it was really good that this public school was doing well. And um, right before the World Cup, the state government of Rio decided to demolish that school to build a parking lot. The school was right next to the Maracanã Stadium, where the big final match was played, um, and there wasn't enough place for cars, uh, which I now know are not very used. So, too bad. Yeah, the 96% of cars that were going to be parked uh, were going to be parked in the school. Um, and the students of the school, actually, Bia, who's shown in this picture, started a campaign using one of our platforms, and that is the technology that they use to campaign. Um, this is a... a website that we created called Jiguarda, and we use this for monitoring of public spaces. So the way it works is if there is a public space that is in danger, it could be a slum that is about to be evicted without due process, or in this specific case, the school, um, you can put a webcam in any place that can monitor that public space 24-7, and people can come into this website to become guardians of that public space. So when they come, they essentially click a button to become guardians, they leave their data, um, and specifically the cell phone information, and anyone who's watching that public space through the webcam 
can, at the click of a button, send an SMS to everyone who has signed up to become a guardian. So we did this for the school. We monitored the school during the summer holidays when the parents and students thought that the school was going to be demolished. And every time a bulldozer came, we would send an SMS message to 20,000 people in the city who had signed up to become guardians of the school. And some of them would physically come to the school and stand in front of it to guard it. So after that happened a couple of times, the, the state government wasn't very happy, um, and they decided to pull back on the project and leave the school as it was. The press really loved this story, because it's, it's a great photo op when you have little kids standing in front of their school. Um, so there you go. So that's one example of how people can coordinate and work together to advocate for something they want. Another example that I'm going to give to you was a pressure campaign that we did to change the state constitution for the state of Rio. So um, Brazil, as you all know, is a relatively new democracy, and we're still building our democratic institutions, and that path is a complicated one. There is no perfect democracy. There is only democracies being built every day by their citizens, right? And one of the things that we didn't have in Brazil was really any protection against uh, people who have been convicted for corruption being elected again. So a few years back, we passed a federal bill um, that essentially precluded anyone who had been convicted for corruption in the past from running for office again. But there were no provisions uh, for people in high trust positions in government. So those are the people that are not elected, they're appointed into office, right? And we decided to take that matter at the local level by changing the state constitution in Rio to essentially preclude anyone who had been convicted for corruption from being appointed into state government. That was a pressure campaign. We used um, a different platform for that one. It's this one, it's called the pressure cooker. Uh, in Brazil, we have a saying uh, that says that politicians are like beans, they only work in the pressure cooker. So we built a digital pressure cooker. And the way it works is that anyone can come and create a campaign page, invite their friends and family to send emails to um, the decision maker on a specific issue. We also have a phone functionality, so if you leave your cell phone number on the campaign page, our robot calls you and connects you for free to the public phone of that decision maker. So all of a sudden, if you're a mayor or a secretary, you might be receiving thousands of emails or thousands of phone calls lined up in a row of people, citizens, your constituents, talking about the same issue. And that does create a dialogue between citizens and elected representatives that really changes the dynamic in terms of how city politics work, especially at the city level, because you know your constituents so well. Um, so we did that pressure campaign, pressuring all um, legislators for the state Congress uh, right before that bill was uh, up for a vote. And the change in the Constitution was actually approved unanimously, even though most people, when we started, said it was a lost cause and politicians would never go for it. But once we put the spotlight on it, it was really something that no one wanted to be on record uh, as voting no on. Um, and that's how it changed. Um, a third example is from a... Um, collectively bill writing projects. So we have a platform called Legislando that is essentially a platform for people to write bills together. So we created a template. You know how bills always have that very specific legal language that no one really understands and it's always kind of the same. So we built essentially templates for bills. So we give you all of the legalese. You come in and you write the bill that you want to write and your friends and family and community can write it with you. And then we have a special login for congressmen and congresswomen. So they can come into this platform and adopt a bill. They can say, I like this idea that it's coming from my constituents. Now I'm going to introduce this bill up for a vote in parliament. Um, and we do that again at the local level as well. And this bill was um, written by a photographer who covered the 2013 protests in Rio and lost his sight when he was hit by a rubber bullet in his eye. And he wanted to create a bill to preclude the police from using rubber bullets at close proximity. So he had to put a minimum distance, a safe distance between uh, the crowds and uh, any use of rubber bullets. So he wrote this bill with um, a bunch of different people. He was introduced into the Congress. He was approved. The governor of Rio, however, of Sao Paulo, sorry, this was in another city, vetoed it. So it didn't actually go through. And I'm giving you this example also to show that uh, in the democratic process, there will be disagreements and we won't always get our way, but I think the process of engagement and of doing these things together with your community, with your neighbors, is extremely powerful. Um, one last example is from this campaign that was charted by a mom, uh, Jovita, which you can see in the, who you can see in the picture. She uh, lost her daughter about 10 years ago. Her daughter went missing, and Rio actually has a really big problem with missing people. 
Uh, 6,000 people are reported missing every year. That's a higher number than what we had under the military dictatorship. So we have more people disappearing now. Uh, Javita's daughter never really showed again, but for 10 years, Javita has been going to every single hospital in Rio, every single morgue in the city, and all of the homeless shelters every week. Because if your body shows up in a morgue and you're not documented, the morgue in Rio only keeps that body for a week. And her biggest fear is that her daughter would be found or her daughter's body would be found and buried without any proper identification. She started a campaign to create a civil police unit in the city of Rio specializing in, in disappeared people. And that unit would have integrated data from different places where disappeared people could show up. And that was already working in a different city in Brazil, so she had an example of that at work, and she knew it could really be impactful in Rio. So she advocated for it for six months. We used a different technology to help her out. Um, this is a platform called Multitudi, which essentially matches um, people with talents, designers, videographers, however, with people that want to start campaigns. And it's really handy and really helpful uh, for the campaigns that we run where we really need to tell a story in a really powerful way, which was exactly the case with Javita. So in this case, we used Multitude to match her up with a team of editors and filmmakers that really told her story and the story of other moms like her in a super compelling, super powerful way. And we use all of that material both to engage the community but also to show to the, the, the civil police authorities how important that, uh, that was. After six months of campaigning, the head of the civil police in Rio, who was a woman, um, decided to actually implement that civil police unit specializing in disappeared people. It took her almost a year to, uh, to actually implement it. Uh, we monitor the entire process throughout, and that police unit was launched about um, a year ago. It's already solving 87% of the cases that are reported to it in, in the state of Rio. And soon, we're going to have a new tool for collaborative reporting of police violence, which is um, obviously a big problem in Rio, not only in Rio, in many places around the world. And we've been in touch with uh, the head of the correction agencies for the state police in Rio. And the correction agencies themselves don't really have enough data on police violence because people are afraid of coming forward. So we're trying to build something that allows people to anonymously report on police violence to do so collaboratively. So we're putting together video and testimony from different people and then integrating that with the systems of the correction agencies. Through that work, we have built a community just in the city of Rio of over 200,000 registered members. And about half of them are about my age. They're 18 to 32 year olds. They are what we call the millennials. And why is that important? Why is it important that we engage in that specific generation? Actually, we have one in every 12 millennials in the city of Rio in our platform now. Um, and it's important because this is a special generation. I firmly believe this is the generation that will really change the world, and I have reason to believe that. Um, the first reason is that we are better educated than everyone else, so we have access to higher education at unprecedented rates. We are also more driven by access and ownership. I think that really speaks to the blah, blah, car model. Like we are a generation that is much more comfortable having access to services and goods, not necessarily owning them ourselves. We just want to have mobility, not necessarily own a car. Um, we are feminists, and that's something that surprises people often, but we actually have a higher prevalence of women who self-identify as feminists in this generation than we had in the immediately previous one. Uh, so we're a gender-positive generation, and we are more civically engaged. So these kinds of platforms and tools that were born of this generation, that were really only possible uh, for this generation, were never really there before, are taking the potential that comes with this, uh, with this generation, with the young people that are out there in the world trying to change it, and we take it to the next level by making it easier for people to connect and act together. Um, one interesting thing is that this is not just a phenomenon that is affecting the rich kids, which is something that I hear a lot when I talk about this. Actually, in the case of our uh, organization, about 50% of the campaigns that are started in our platform are started in the north zone of Rio, which is uh, the poorest and most uh, densely populated area in the city. So this is not just the Rio elite acting, this is everyone acting. Um, and of course, 15% of the campaigns are, are a victory, um, which means that 85% of them aren't. And again, that is what happens when you have a democratic system. Sometimes you advocate for something and you don't get your way, but the process itself is important in that sense. Um, one thing that I also wanted to tell you is that in spite of having a young membership, we are entirely funded by our members. 
in the state of in the city of Rio. The expansion process that we're going through right now isn't, uh, but the activities in Rio are entirely funded by the members. So this is also a generation that understands the power of contributing, really, even financially, to something that they really believe in, and the importance of remaining independent from governments, from political parties, from corporations, in order to do work that is meaningful to us. Um, this is actually the, the platform that we use just to show you the tech a little bit uh, for those donations. And before I go, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our, um, our expansion plans. Our ambition now is to take this model to other cities around the world. So we open up a selection process to find amazing talent in different cities. We had over 600 applicants from people around the world. I don't think we had anyone in Moscow, so if you know anyone good, we're looking. Um, and the idea is to begin by targeting medium or large cities that are deeply unequal and have good internet infrastructure. So that's essentially what the criteria are. More than a million people, Gini coefficient, which measures inequality of 0.4 or higher, and um, other factors being in a country that at least has a hybrid regime, uh, even if democracy isn't completely consolidated, um, and having uh, internet infrastructure. We estimate that in about 200,000, uh, sorry, 200 cities in the world uh, that fit that bill. This is not an accurate map, this is just a heat. Um, a heat visualization. Most of these cities are actually in Latin America, so good for us. We're right next to them. And of course, the big vision moving forward is to build this huge network of citizens in cities around the world, a network that is capable of really connecting people um, and igniting these people power movements all over the world um, so that we can tackle our global challenges at the local level, remaining uh, you know, global in our vision and advocate for just cities, for more democratic cities and for more sustainable cities in our generation's lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Sandra. You. It was very interesting. Um, I have two questions for you. Of course. Uh, one is, uh, it, it is possible that in, in your activity you've made some enemies <laughs> in the government and some other organizations. Um, and uh, so the question is, were there any attempts to uh, block your website? Did you receive any threats or any... So how, how do you ha did it happen and how do you handle it? I'm so harmless. I'm a 27-year-old, 43-kilo girl. Like, how could I make an enemy? No, that's not true. <laughs> uh, we have some people that don't love us um, in, in government, but I think m over the years, we've been around for about four years now, and over the years, um, we've developed a good relationship with some people inside of, of the government. We also know that governments are not homogeneous, right? Like, not everyone is evil, not everyone is good, and you have to find your allies and people who want to contribute to building a more democratic city from the inside out. Um, we've also, I think, shown our elected representatives that what we were doing, uh, yes, sometimes it will lead to heavy criticism on, on policy and on politicians, but at the same time, we also gave them an outlet to actually communicate with their constituents a lot better. So the worst kind of public rage is a public rage that no one really understands, and in a way, we're giving meaning to people's indignation, right? Like, instead of just being outraged at everything, people are just, you know, creating causes, creating specific demands, and that makes it easier for government to engage with them, too. Great, thank you. Um, and my second question is a little more complicated. Let's, uh, let's say you have a corrupt government official and you create a campaign, a lot of effort, a lot of writing, and you force this corrupt official to change his or her mind, and uh, instead of demolishing something, they don't do it. But it did, doesn't change the system. Uh, it's still the corrupt official in, in the same office, and next time, he makes or he or she makes a decision, you have to start the whole thing over again. again yeah. How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, I think some of our campaigns are more systematic than others, or they, they are about system change, like the one that I showed you on, on uh, changing the constitution, uh, which could actually keep corrupt officials out of government in the long run. Uh, it's not retroactive, unfortunately, so. That didn't work, but we'll, we'll be working on it in the next few years. Other campaigns are more punctual, but I think the, the big change that we're trying to make here is more about political culture. I mean, we're never going to eliminate corruption entirely. Corruption is just a virtue of any institution. It would just happen. Um, we can limit it. We can create provisions to limit it. But I think the most important thing we need to, thing we need to do is actually uh, show 
politicians corrupt or not, that people care, that people are watching, and that hopefully will have not only an impact on people's behavior, but on uh, the behavior of our governments too. The worst thing you can have is a corrupt political system that is also completely unaccountable. And when accountability mechanisms are not a given, I think it, it is our responsibility as citizens to come together and find ways of doing that in a peaceful way, in a, in a, in a constructive way, but also in an in a intentional way. Great. Thank you so much. Thank It was you. fascinating.